Oh, hello everybody. Um, following on from Keith and Richard's recent talk about the impact of leverage in ETFs, I thought I'd uh, highlight a few other points uh, about ETFs to everybody. I think in general, they're absolutely fascinating and very, very useful structure for private investors. Um, but there are a few things to, to note, and that's what I'm hoping to bring out today. But before we get into it, I will read the disclaimer. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. The views of any guests we may have on the show are entirely their own may not represent the views of Portfolio Matters. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Take it away, Stuart. Okay, uh, so the first point that I wanted to highlight is the issue of ETFs and jurisdictions. I, I was sort of flummoxed by this. I thought, well, look, why am I buying an S&P 500 tracker quoted in London when I can buy one uh, quoted in the States? And um, it, it, it's, it's a, quite a complex uh, issue because it, it does seem like a better idea to buy um, a US listed ETF. There's a lot of variety on the US markets. And uh, I was listening to Jim Grant of Grant's Interest Rate Observer the other day, and he was talking about uh, an ETF called INFL, or inflation, which is a basket of stocks that are um, supposed to be very highly uh, protective of any upcoming inflation. Um, that's an interesting one. Uh, US listed ETFs often have lower expense ratios than uh, UK listed ones. And they're, they're much larger and more liquid. Um, so all in all, it, it seems like a, a very interesting place to go fish for, for an ETF. However, uh, you can do it, but watch out. The most important thing I would stress for people is if they are a UK taxpayer, they must only invest in ETFs that have got uh, the qualification of being an HMRC reporting status ETF. This is very important from a tax point of view. Um, it sounds illogical, but it's true. If you buy a US listed ETF that does not have reporting status, then you will be paying income tax rates on any capital gains, which you do not want to be doing. Now, most US listed ETFs are not gonna to go to the trouble of getting HMRC reporting status. There may be a few, but in general, it's not likely to, to be there. Uh, the other impact, of course, of buying a US listed ETF or a Canadian one or, um, you know, uh, or wherever, is that you're going to be subject to the withholding taxes that that jurisdiction applies. So the US, for instance, would apply a 30% withholding tax to dividends. Uh, you can, of course, fill out the, the famous W8 Ben form and reduce that to 15%, but do you really want to go uh, through those hoops? Uh, the other issue will be... Um, depending on who your broker is, but if you're using a typical UK broker to buy an overseas listed stock, you'll be paying their FX charges, and they are, frankly, I think, usurious. You know, one and a half percent is fairly common um, for a modest size uh, FX trade, which is a pretty painful, given that we know how close the spread really should be. Um, the broker might not let you uh, trade international securities or might require you to to sign off various documentation um, asserting you're a sophisticated investor so that they protect themselves. And the final thing is that you can't hold a US listed ETF in an ISA. But the dominating thing is this reporting status. Um, you, you really don't want to get, get tangled up paying income tax rates on capital gains. So before you move on, Stuart, can I just come in on the broker's FX charges? because I have uh, actually some experience of trying different brokers and trying to minimize my FX charges. And I originally had an ac account with Interactive Investor, and they claimed that you could have um, charges of 0.1% on the FX charges for individual trades but that turned out to be only on trades above a hundred thousand pounds sterling 
Now, <laughs> very few people are ever going to do trades of a hundred grand a clip. And yep. on normal ones, it turned out to be one and a half percent. So, you know, that's a three percent round trip. And so I got caught out with this and I closed the account. Now, mm -hmm. I all now have an account with Interactive Broker and they're really good. So actually they charge a commission, I think of $2 and you do it in the market. And so the bid offer spread on um, currencies is absolutely minuscule. Um, so it's effectively pretty much two quid, you know, to trans. Right. Yeah. So that makes a huge difference. So you need to yeah. shop around for brokers, but I can, from my personal experience, interactive broker are really good and interactive investor are truly terrible. Uh, turning to the next point, although ETF is the, the phrase that we usually use, um, there are quite a few products out there which are actually exchange traded notes. Now these are not a fund in the normal sense that you would think of say uh, an S&P or a FTSE 100 tracker. These are actually debt notes linked to a benchmark issued by an investment bank. Now they do allow uh, daily exchange trading like an ETF, but they are very different uh, fundamentally and legally. Um, they're in effect a debt from the investment bank and that debt has an end date. So the product has an end date. So you will have a tax crystallizing event at some point in the future when that ETN uh, finishes up. They can, however, be held in ISAs and in SIPs. But the, the key thing is it is a debt from an investment bank. Now, 99.9% .9 of the time, that's not a problem, but occasionally it is. Uh, 2008, Lehman, et cetera, you don't really want um, to be exposed to the credit risk of an investment bank at that time. You might eventually get your assets back as most Lehman creditors did, but after a torturous process and many years later, now, because they're actually a debt note linked to a benchmark, often the tracking error uh, is actually very, very low because you're not managing a pool of assets and suffering transaction costs and uh, slightly drifting from the benchmark. You, you are getting the benchmark. Uh, then these ETNs are often used for harder to access uh, areas of markets. So, for instance, uh, they're often used for commodities, uh, for oil, for gold. Um, etc. Uh, you can also, uh, they can also be used for things like volatility. You can take bets on the VIX index, for instance, or on the yield curve or on currency strategies. Now, just to point out one um, slight wrinkle for commodity linked uh, ETNs is that there is the risk of contango. That is, as you roll from one contract to another, you can, in effect, sort of lose. Um, or if the future dated contract is more expensive than the near dated contract. I, I see a wry smile from you there, Keith. Mm. Well, I remind viewers who haven't seen it to go and watch my my worst trade, the iPath VIX ETN, where I suffered exactly this problem from. So anyway. Um, another big aspect of ETFs is the issue of you buy a synthetic one or a physical one. Physical one, very simple to understand. You, you have, for instance, a FTSE 100 um, ETF. It'll hold, um, hopefully if the manager is competent, it'll hold um, all constituents in the correct proportions. And it, you will, um, in effect, have the exposure of those real physical assets. And should the fund get into trouble, that's what you can um, claim on those, those constituents. But um, particularly at the beginning of uh, the life of ETFs, uh, synthetic ETFs were popular, where the fund might actually hold um, a basket of, of almost anything and enter into a swap to give the an underlying economic exposure to something totally different. So that there are pros and cons that synthetic are not um, completely uh, uh, to be avoided. Um, but they are rather like the ETNs. You've got the counterparty risk with the swap provider. So there is a risk that the collateral that the swap provider gives to the uh, ETF may be insufficient in, in extreme cases. 
and sometimes it's difficult to see through to see what the costs are. But the synthetic, a bit like ETNs, does or can have a much lower tracking error because you're swapping for a benchmark index. And, and if the investment bank is uh, credit worthy and uh, provides that, that index return, you've got very low tracking error. There have been cases where synthetic is actually better and easier to liquidate than physical. Um, for instance, I, I believe there was a case where Malaysia closed their capital markets and it wasn't possible to liquidate physical securities. But if you just agree a price with um, the investment bank that's given you a swap, it can actually be quicker mm. and um, easier to, to liquidate um, some positions. Having said that, what has really happened over the life of ETFs is that synthetics have gradually been squeezed out. Um, so uh, from a position of about 50-50 in 2010, um, now it's much more like 80-20 in favor of physical versus synthetic ETFs. A few other things on ETFs for people to be aware of. Um, the fund trades at very close to its NAV via an arbitrage mechanism where authorized participants can swap baskets of stocks for units or units for baskets of stocks. And this is a very efficient uh, way to keep the price of the ETF uh, very close to the NAV uh, of, the, of the assets. And I would say that the, the structure has, has worked really very well, even in all the crashes um, that we've had over the past um, 10 years. Now, there has been a big debate um, focused actually on bond ETFs, where the price of the ETF appeared to be trading at a big discount to the NAV. But the managers would argue that, in fact, it was a stale NAV because many bonds don't trade. Mm. And the ETF was actually a fairer reflection of what the market price of those assets really was. And I think, on the whole, the, the managers are, are, are right about this. The mechanism has, has held together um, even in the, these crashes. Um, you should also be aware that um, ETFs uh, can do stock lending. So for instance, if they hold a whole basket of, of equities, they can earn a few basis points by lending them out. Now that's usually of the level of a few basis points, but in some more esoteric areas of the market, for instance, high yield bonds, um, it has been known for some ETFs to, to earn an extra 1% a year from the stock lending. Mm. Uh, and finally, there's the, the issue of accumulating versus distributing ETFs. That is, do they pay out their, their income or do they roll it up within the fund? Now, you might think that an accumulating ETF is, is very simple. It, it um, enables you to continue to have exposure to, to the market and small dividends in effect get reinvested in the same asset class uh, and grow nicely. Well, that is true, but I would only ever hold an accumulating ETF in a tax exempt account. Because if you hold an accumulating ETF in a taxable account, you're going to get involved in all sorts of paperwork headaches mm. because you, it's not a way of avoiding tax on the distribution. You have to uh, dig in, find out what that year's distribution was and declare that as income, which is fiddly. But it gets worse because imagine you had a, a unit price uh, which was ac accumulating the income, and in three or four years' time, you wanted to sell the ETF, it'll be very tempting just to look at the unit price that you've sold at, the unit price that you bought at, and say that's your capital gain. But actually, you should be deflating the price at which you sold the ETF for the, di for the distributions that have accumulated over the, over the holding period of the ETF. Now, it's, it's just, you just don't want to go there, I think, from a, a paperwork point of view. So accumulating ETF, absolutely fine in a, in a SIP or an ISA, but in a taxable account, I would avoid it. It's just um, you know, too painful. So um, some ETFs that have come to my attention, there are some weird and wonderful ones out there, but that's not really my world, as regular listeners will, will know. But here are some um, more uh, esoteric ones that have definitely caught my interest. Um, the first one is an emerging market value ETF. So the bet here is on emerging markets, which are unloved, and value, which is unloved. 
So um, this is a contrarian bet. It's a bet that unsurprisingly, um, GMO Woolley in their asset class forecasts think is the sole asset class offering respectable real returns into the future as they bet on mean reversion for emerging markets and mean reversion for value. So it's quoted in, in London, it's from iShares, the stock code is EMVL. It holds 190 stocks, screened on all the usual measures, so price to earnings, price to book, enterprise, enterprise value to cash flow, etc. There are US dollar and euro share classes. It is an accumulating income fund, so I only hold it in the SIP or the ISA. And it's a physical ETF of about 235 million with a somewhat expensive total expense ratio of 0.4%. Uh, so for any contrarian out there, um, this one's interesting. It's on my watch list, but I've not pressed the button or bought it myself yet. Uh, here's another one that I thought um, uh, viewers and listeners might be interested in. This is the iShares S&P 500 Energy Sector ETF. So that basically, this, this is Keith's bet on, on the oil market um, via oil companies, but it's only the US companies. So this avoids the um, renewable energy investments from uh, so Total, BP, Shell, etc. And the bet is, in effect, that the US management is going to be a lot more hard-headed and shareholder-focused um, and will not be uh, following uneconomic um, investment opportunities. Mm. So uh, from iShares, I-U-E-S is the code. It holds only 22 stocks, um, but that's across the majors like um, Exxon and uh, Chevron, uh, but also the EMP companies and some pipeline companies. There are share classes in dollars, pounds or euros, another accumulated income one, Pretty uh, chunky, $735 million uh, uh, fit holding physical stocks, and I think a very competitive expense ratio of just 0.15%. So that is one that um, brings people's attention, and it is one that I, I own some of. Uh, another one that uh, caught my interest was the Luxor MSCI Emerging Markets X China. So this was really prompted by all the regulatory action that we're seeing out of China clamping down on, um, for instance, we've seen obviously on the property sector, but also on tutoring companies. It's really a, a bet that, look, is China really going to support foreigners' property rights? And if it isn't, and you, you want emerging markets, but not China, this is the one for you. So 678 stocks. And Taiwan is 22%, Korea 19%, India 18%, Brazil 7%, etc. So it is somewhat hostage to the index's definitions of what an emerging market is. I mean, I would argue Taiwan and Korea are developed markets, really. But uh, for whatever reason, the uh, index creators still have them as emerging markets. It's fairly small, only about $80 billion um, AUM at the moment, at 0.25% fee. It is a swap-based uh, ETF, and the stock code is EMXC for the US dollar share class. Now, uh, the final one that I was going to bring to people's attention is the MSCI World Tracker. There are many different uh, ETF providers uh, offer this. And I'm, I'm pointing it out because when friends and family have asked what to buy you know, as a long-term core investment, I've often said, oh, just buy you know, a world equity tracker on the basis that you, know, you want to be in equities long term, and this is the most diversified tracker there is. And please don't ask me again for uh, different uh, you know, ideas every month, just fire and forget, buy this. But actually, my goodness, if you look into it, the mm. outperformance of the US stock market has reflects, uh, reflects itself in a very, very skewed distribution geographically. Now, this is the MSCI developed markets. Um, but uh, the United States represents 68% of that index. And Japan, the next largest, is 6.6%. So the US is 10 times the size of the next constituent. So yes, it is the MSCI world. It is very diversified. But my goodness, it, it's so tilted to, to the US. So in conclusion, um, 
be careful of overseas listed ETFs. And by overseas, here I mean in particular the US. Uh, buying ones um, which are domiciled, for instance, in Dublin is, is not uh, an overseas ETF. Uh, I would avoid them uh, as a default. Uh, secondly, know what you're buying. ETNs and ETCs are the debts of investment banks. They're not funds where you own the underlying assets of the benchmark. Physically backed ETFs are probably preferable to synthetic ones, not in every case, but it keeps things simple. And talking of uh, keeping life simple, don't hold accumulating ETFs in taxable accounts. Thank you, Stuart. Very interesting. Um, so key takeaways for me, the reporting status is really crucial, actually. If you don't have the recording, the uh, <clears throat> reporting status and you're going to have to pay income tax rates on uh, any gains you make that really undermines the attractiveness of the investment and so i think um your policy of avoiding set uh, etfs listed elsewhere outside london would seem to be a good one um the other thing is that um yeah the uh, paperwork involved in accumulating ETFs does seem uh, burdensome and uh, you can avoid it only if you put them into SIPs and ICEs. So that's probably a good idea. Now, I was, I was quite interested in your um, emerging markets value ETF, Stuart, which seems very unlike you. Very, that seems quite risky to me. But I would say, actually, that we are at the wrong stage of the cycle. So I would say that that sort of... Um, Emerging markets and value shares will both do well if we get a strong sustained increase in global growth. And right now, growth is fading and we actually seem to be having a spasm of um, risk aversion and the dollar is strengthening. So all of that, I think, is short term could be quite bad for emerging markets and actually value stocks. So when we get through this period and things come a bit clearer, that may well be a good bet, but I would be holding off for now. But anyway, thank you very much for that, uh, sharing your expertise once again. I think that's it. So um, thank you to Stuart Owen, and I hope you'll press like and subscribe to the channel. And it is goodbye from Stuart Owen. And goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Goodbye. Full disclaimer. The material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.